books are written, illustrated, bought, sold, and loaned. But this one was salvaged and assembled several decades after it was written. It's a special kind of encyclopedia, which usually offers answers. This one contains a mystery. Shops full of antiques or oddities offer relics that bring us closer to the past. Art. Furniture. Toys. And objects that seem to defy a category. What John Corbett finds in a junk store's final sale is like a key to another world, a manuscript of loose typewriter paper. There was very interesting language in it. The object itself was fascinating already. It was kind of crumbling pieces of manuscript page that were typewritten. It's not a famous author's first edition. In fact, no one's sure who wrote it. But as an experienced collector and artist, Corbett has to have it. I got set for the negotiation that I anticipated would take us into the stratosphere, and then he ended up pitching me quite a low price. <laughs> and he saw me balk, and then he lowered even further, and I, uh, I uh, uh, so I bought it. But who is the author? A handwriting analyst investigates the manuscript notes. We'll examine the backstory of an encyclopedia of Chicago mobsters, the underworld's famous and forgotten. Manuscripts falling apart, little yeah. bits of it are crumbling yeah. even as we look. Immediately tell how old this paper is. The typewritten manuscript lists an assortment of con artists, hitmen, and hangers-on in alphabetical order. The first entry, a seemingly insignificant bodyguard, Tony Accardo, a man who would someday rule an entire criminal organization. But in 1933, he gets just three lines. Tony Accardo, Tony is Jack McGurn's bodyguard and either lives near or with the machine gunner in Oak Park. As far as McGurn is concerned, Tony's like Mary's little lamb. I started reading it, and the language was hard-boiled, film noir style, and it was very appealing. And I could tell that it seemed to be complete, and it seemed like a real thing. Margaret Mary Martha Collins, alias Mary Hamilton, and Faye Sullivan, the death kiss, the kiss of death. More deadly than Cleopatra's asp, Death Kiss Mary has proved a hoodoo to seven gangsters, all of whom are resting under green sod after having tasted the doubtful pleasures of the little lady's lips. But there's a mystery here. Who wrote it? This is someone who might be an ex-cop, might be, might be someone from within the mob, but it's somebody with a flair for language, for a kind of vernacular, and that is super appealing to me. And, and I, I would argue that it's got a, a artistic merit on its own, um, in addition to being funny and um, sometimes totally outrageous. There is only one mark against Mary in all her 33 years, Saul Feldman. We've had a number of speculations, uh, none of which has panned out. He was shot and began recovering until Mary planted a lusty smack on his pallid lips. Can you show us the envelope? You know, it's, uh, it's directed at Frank Norris at Time Magazine, but then that's scratched out, so uh, I don't know. It's really hard to say. Sure, it exactly. could have just been reusing an old envelope. Yep. Yeah. Is there any significance to the year 1933 as it relates to what's going on here? Well, I th speculate, this is completely mm -hmm. speculative, but I think that the reason that someone would feel at liberty in 1933 is that Capone's stranglehold on the city had just been lessened by him going to jail. Corbett works with a book publisher in 2010 to assemble the loose sheets into a book. But Encyclopedia of Chicago Mobsters doesn't seem to have the flair such a book warrants. 
We were looking for a good title for the book, and it actually was right there for us. Uh, there was a this little slip of paper that says, Collection, Bullets for Dead Hoods. That just jumped out as a fantastic possible title, Bullets for Dead Hoods. They're all <laughs> bullet entries, and yeah. none of them are alive anymore, so. So is the mystery of the anonymous author a cold case? It's very, very colorful. It sort of almost slaps the reader in the face or grabs the reader by the throat and says, read this, this is interesting. Pretty much very similar stuff for one of the Chicago papers. We consult with mob historian John Binder. Binder says the catalog has some interesting insights and a few minor inaccuracies. You don't know what to make of it. If we knew who the author was, we could say, ah, well, this guy, this guy's a solid journalist. His colleague at the Al Capone Museum suggests the author could be reporter Eddie Doherty. Did you notice any similarity in the language between this and the Bullets for Dead Hoods manuscript? Yeah, Eddie Doherty has a fairly colorful style, kind of rat a rat-a-tat-tat -tat style. Binder says Doherty is a colorful writer with his own colorful backstory. Eddie and his five brothers that were in the papers, they were all crime reporters. They had um, an advantage. Eddie Doherty, the journalist, his father, James Doherty, was a lieutenant and at one time acting captain in the Chicago Police Department. And they might have had a bit of an upper hand as journalists. Binder tracks down Doherty's draft registration from World War I and World War II. At least in terms of, you know, what to the naked eye came out of the handwriting. Um, gee, Eddie Doherty might be a candidate for this. So what I'm actually going to do to make this a little bit easier is I'm We take the handwriting samples to Kevin Kobaki. Is I'm basically going to create a chart on the fly as we go. He's a professional analyst who examines clues from the penmanship in the draft cards and from the memos in the mob manuscript. So we're looking at not only the letter formations themselves, but subtle details. So the red are things that are not in common. He also compares the manuscript memos to a letter Ed Doherty wrote in 1957. Kobaki says his analysis shows Doherty did not write the memos, noting several significant differences. For Corbett, the appeal of his manuscript is not the bloodshed, but how it captures a moment in time. After O'Banion's death, he, Weiss, and Drucci ruled the north side, where a smoking gun barrel was and is more eloquent than honeyed words. What's interesting to me about it is the grit and the texture of it, not necessarily the violence of it. Mrs. Anna Gleason, as she prefers to be known, despite half a dozen aliases, is a lovely old woman, over 60 now, but still looking the part of a Lakeshore Drive dowager in her furs. The nicknames, the locales, all of that aspect of it, I see that as the grit that's so drawing to me. But sometimes in a place known as the Second City, elements of urban life are lost. Evidence of the grit and texture seems to disappear with the generation that creates it. That is the story of so much Chicago history that hasn't been documented adequately. The jazz history runs that way, art history runs that way. Chicago, you know, it's a town that you leave to get famous. But perhaps stay to achieve infamy. Now even the hoodlums on the fringes have their moment on record, even if it's far too late for them to appreciate. They brought Annie to trial for the jewel theft but no evidence could convict her, and the veteran crook darted out of the criminal court after promising to go straight. A leopard can't change its spots. Once again, John Corbett's book is Bullets for Dead Hoods. Coming up on Backstory, we'll take a look at conspiracy theories. They want to be kind of quasi-scientific. They want to make it seem like, OK, there's a logic here. But, and you get that with a lot of magical beliefs. How can we convince friends to shed their strange beliefs that aren't based on facts? And the dancing lipizons have a new addition 